Of all the industries disrupted, upended by the Internet, the news business is right up there on the list. Newsrooms have shrunk. Many papers have stopped printing since that ad space is no longer the valued commodity it once was. Responding to the new reality, many of the biggest names in news have started to sell a new kind of service based on their ability to connect with readers, to tell stories. And it's now available to corporate clients to burnish their image. It's the kind of content that a reader might see on that site anyway, even mistake for journalism, which is why this expanding industry is known as native advertising. In their own defense, news executives are stressing the separation of church, the editorial staff, and state, the business side. However, some big names in print have already blurred that boundary, and news consumers are understandably confused about content that got its start in business meetings rather than editorial ones. The Listening Post's Will Young now on native advertising and the new business behind the news business. The internet age has not been kind to newspapers. With the digital transition has come declining circulation, shrinking newsrooms, and many papers stopping their presses permanently. Fewer copies sold means advertisers are paying less to appear in print. No prizes for guessing where they want to be seen instead. Google and Facebook now swallow up around 80% of all advertising money. Now, in a very, so that in a very short period of time, money which predominantly went to news publishers or to publishers in general, magazines, newspapers, whatever, now goes to the platforms. Against that background, news publishers started looking for a new way of sucking advertising back in. And what they said to advertisers was, why don't you let us design your ads for you? So there's always been a relationship between industry, companies, PR firms, ad agencies, and reporters. So a lot of times reporters, they kind of get their tips and leads from companies and PR firms calling them up saying, hey, company X is launching this new product, we think it's great, and here's why, maybe you should write about it. However, native advertising is very different because a reporter can hang up on a public relations call, right? And he can say, no, I'm really not that interested. But what happens when the native advertising agency exists one floor above you, when both of you work at the same publication? And it's happening all over the world. In-house creative teams consisting of journalists and marketers working together to produce so-called advertorial for brands and corporations. Back in 2016, an industry survey found that of the publishers in question, 35% considered native advertising to be very important for their business. Last year, that figure rose to 50%. And leading the way are some of the biggest names in journalism, such as the New York Times, whose tea brand studio produces what they call paid posts. One of the early pieces we did that got quite a bit of acclaim was a, a seven chapter um, interactive data visualization for Goldman Sachs. And that ran on our site for quite a while. The user comes to the Times to get immersed in, to pay great attention to really high quality storytelling on topics that matter. And I think there's a benefit to a marketer for just being a part of that ecosystem. Native schmative. An ad is an ad is an ad, is the way I feel about it. The New York Times should not be in the business of managing people's opinion of Goldman Sachs. There is no way that I can take as seriously the New York Times reporting on Goldman Sachs, knowing that they have just been on this uh, content creation journey together. Native advertising is just an effort to confuse readers to think that they're getting something other than an ad. Standard practice at the New York Times and other outlets is to label branded content so readers know when it's been paid for by a client. However, London's large circulation free newspaper, The Evening Standard, shows us where the lines between business and editorial can be blurred to the point of erasure. Back in May, an expose by Open Democracy revealed that the Standard was offering not just branded content, but money can't buy positive news and favourable comment pieces that would appear to readers as journalism. When the story broke, the Standard quietly postponed the scheme. But last year, a likely six-figure deal the Standard struck with Syngenta 
earned the agribusiness giant glowing reports, putting them at the heart of the future of food production. No reference to the controversies that dog the company, and not a mention of sponsorship in sight. The Evening Standard in London started um, presenting to clients, suggesting that they would not only get advertorial produced for them by Evening Standard staff, but that this would lead to them getting better news coverage. Now, this led to real concern amongst Evening Standard staff, because what you're actually saying is, we're going to hoodwink our audience so that our audience doesn't realise that you've paid us and your name will just slip into the news coverage. This really does blur the line between what is permissible as advertising, as paid for content, and, and what is not. Something that is never to be tampered with is the utter independence of our newsroom from the commercial interest of an individual advertiser. We had to create a group of people that were entirely separate from the newsroom operation of the New York Times. We would share the storytelling tools, but we would never share the storytellers. To say that there's always been a sturdy wall between the business side of an organization and the editorial newsroom, that, that hasn't historically always been true. Now when you have these people on the business side that are former journalists pitching to real journalists in the newsroom and they walk into the same building every day and they both share the mission of the paper, right? Which these days is mostly to keep news alive and to make sure that you're reporting and you can keep the lights on. In an era of anxiety about the future of news, native advertising is providing comfort. Journalists seem to be every bit as qualified as copywriters and creatives at generating the kind of content that corporations love, earning news outlets a share in the revenues that might otherwise have gone to ad agencies or PR companies. But while native advertising might keep journalism's heart pumping, some say the risk is that journalism is selling its soul. Advertisers aren't stupid. When they pay money for something, they expect to get something in return. With native advertising, your ad seems to be a little bit more under the aegis of this respectable news organization. If it didn't work like an ad, they wouldn't pay for it like an ad. And that's the important thing to remember, whether it's called storytelling or content or co-branding, it still represents journalists making work using criteria that is something other than journalistic criteria. I think the best way to maintain um, healthy, independent journalism is to maintain a healthy business model. Readers are seeing companies that are using the canvas of a Times article page to tell a story in the appropriate ways I've described before, creating feature-length productions for marketers that stand at the quality level where they can run on a place like the New York Times. For the growing number of news outlets embracing native advertising, there may be no turning back. And yet its impact on audiences is still unclear. Studies find that consumers often confuse native ads with editorial content, and that when they discover what they've been reading is sponsored, their reaction is negative. While the debate over the need for industry regulation rages on, watch out for partnered content, paid programs, content that is brought to you by, in association with, co-created with, or hosted by. The list goes on. It's really hard for a reader to understand what does created by mean, what does powered by mean. When you start to kind of track how these labels have changed over time, what, what it really tells you is that they're trying to push boundaries. More and more content that you're going to see on a news publisher site is going to be funded by some kind of brand. And I think that long term, we're going to have to deal with the effect of like, what is hard news anymore? <laughs>